you know, me to the Lord, what my tea has come. You have come to bring peace. You have come to bring power. You have come to bring uh, deliverance. You have come. You have come to bring joy. You have come to bring peace. Where there's no peace, peace will come. In the name of Jesus Christ, open your mouth and bless the name of the Lord. Worship him, worship him, magnify his name. In the name of Jesus Christ, let us pray that he has come. He will take perfect control in our life. He will take perfect control in our in our ministry. Take perfect control in our families, in the life of our children, the life of all the members of our churches. In the name of Jesus, there shall be transformation of life. There shall be transformation of life. In the name of, open your mouth. Open your mouth. What you want God to do for you, what you want to do for you, not only listening to the testimonies of others, but you will listen and you will give us your testimony. God touched me. God touched me. Move, move, mighty. Move at Alpha Location. Move at our own, in our churches. Move in our families in the name of Jesus Christ. Open your mouth and bless the name of the Lord, the King of Kings, the Counselor, the one man, the mighty God. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the all ever Emmanuel. Open your mouth and bless the name of the open. Pray, pray, pray. Whatever you want to, to tonight, whatever is your own challenge, whatever is your own request, whatever is the problem, whatever you are first, first, first seeing. He said, Call, ask, it shall be given away to you. Ask, ask, it shall be given away to you. Seek, and it shall find. Knock, knock, knock. Not it shall be open unto you. Not to knock, not it shall be open unto you. Ask, ask, ask whatever, whatever request, bring all your request in the name no. of Jesus. Bring your request, bring your request. He has given us the order, he has given us the command, he has given us the promise. He said, Ask the command, and he said, He shall be you ask, he shall, he shall receive for whosoever. Everyone that ask it, receive it. Open your mouth and pray. Open your mouth and pray. Ask and bring your request. Bring whatever burden you have to the to the feet of the Almighty God. Tonight, O oh Lord, touch me. Tonight, O oh Lord, visit me. Tonight, O oh Almighty, do my own. Do my own. Walk mightily in our midst, in our gathering, at the half location walk, in our church, move mightily with your power. Visit us, touch everyone in the name, touch the little one, the children, the youth, the adults, touch everyone in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ. Open your mouth and bless it in the name of the Lord. Father, we bless you, Lord, we worship you, King of glory, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Oh, God Almighty, Father, we pray that you move mighty in our life in the name of Jesus Christ. Touch us, visit us, Emmanuel, and let your presence, your presence abide with us. Move mighty and meet us all at the point of all our means. Let there be a salvation, let there be a holiness, let there be a deliverance, let there be a healing in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, we bless you. Tonight it shall be great. Tonight it shall be mighty. Tonight, the God of peace, so Emmanuel, oh, move mighty in our midst to bring peace. The God, the Prince of Peace, let there be a peace. Where there's no peace, bring peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, the God of power, the Council of bring power. Lord, your power, your power break every yoke. Break every yoke. Destroy the power of darkness. Rescue. Set, set the captive free. Oh, God, are captive, captive, taken by the devil into sin and set them free. Whatever form of captivity is the sin that delivered the captive in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, captive to, oh, <laughs> to the sickness and disease, whatever form of captivity, whatever form of challenge is, oh, Lord, Emmanuel, move mightily in the name of Jesus Christ. Tonight, we thank you, we bless you, we worship you, mighty God. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Brethren, we are going to sing our congregational song as we start with the retreat.
And after this, we will go into the message of our Father in the Lord. Our song we sing from, uh, it is, Jesus only is our message. So the media, over to you, the media will give us so Jesus only is our message.
As we are waiting for our Father in the Lord, Jesus, Emmanuel, you will touch us, you will visit us, you will bless us. Prepare your heart, be expectant that the Lord Almighty will bless in the name of Jesus Christ. Prepare your heart, get ready. We we'll over to you, media. Thank you. Listen to Jesus. Father in the Lord, brethren, let us be expectant, pray, prepare your heart. Nothing will hinder you. Any doubt, any distraction, you take them away. That the Lord will come with his power. The Lord will touch us. The Lord will bless us. Father, we thank you for this morning. We bless your name for what you've done already. Saving us, healing us, delivering us, sanctifying us, making our hearts holy. We're asking, O oh Lord, that in this session, you reveal your might, you reveal your word, and the power in the Holy Ghost that you have promised, your grant to everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that we will be serious, definite, passionate in prayer for your power. And that power will be upon our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. And the people of God said, God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming in a message today to that topic Emmanuel, Jesus, the baptizer. We're told in Matthew chapter 3, reading from verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier, greater, more powerful, higher than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with 
the Holy Ghost and with fire. Here is John the Baptist. John the baptizer in water. He said, I indeed baptize you. That word baptize has been kept in the original baptizo, baptize. And it means to immerse and to dip. When you dip an object into liquid and you totally cover that object and it's immersed, they say in Greek, in the language, baptizo. And it means when John baptized, he did not just sprinkle water on the candidates for baptism. He dipped them. He immersed them inside the water. That's why it says, when Jesus was baptized, coming out of the water. He was in the water. And so he said, I baptize with, the, with, the, with water unto repentance. After repentance, and after the fruit of repentance, after the work of repentance, that lives turn around, lives are changed. Then he says, I now introduce to you one greater than I am, mightier than I am. His shoes are not able, not worthy to bear. He, that Christ, he, that Jesus, he, the Redeemer, he, Emmanuel, God with us, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Look at verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. He sanctifies. He purges. He purges the floor. He takes all the chaff and everything that is non-essential. The games men play. The lives people live. The things that are not essential to their eternal destiny. It says, it will gather its wheat into the garner, and it will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And then in Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Verse 5. In verse 5, for John truly baptized with water, immersed in water, dipped the candidates in water, but ye shall be baptized immersed, enveloped, endued, submerged in the Holy Ghost, not many days ends. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, but he shall receive power. That's what Christ promised when we come to the Lord. We're saved already citizens of the kingdom. We're sanctified were established in the kingdom. We're not coming out and coming in. We're not unstable. We're established. We're steadfast. We belong to the Lord. He says after that, you know, he, pay, he prayed for their sanctification. He said, the not of the world, even as I am not of the world, sanctify them. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. And now, after the salvation, after the sanctification, it says, he shall receive power. Actually, power in salvation, power for sonship. Power at sanctification, power for sanctification. Now, power 
the power of the Holy Ghost, power for service. But he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We receive power, they receive power to be witnesses in Jerusalem. They receive power to be witnesses in all Judea and then in Samaria. And then for not us now who are here to the uttermost part of the earth and to the last dispensation or the last decade of this dispensation and to the last time until Christ will come ye shall receive that power and it shall continue to the uttermost part of the earth and it's Christ that does that it's Emmanuel that does that Emmanuel Jesus the baptizer three things we're looking at number one the prophecy and the promise of the baptism number two the possession of power through the baptism and number three the prayer and passion with the baptism look at number one number one we're looking at the promise we're looking at the prophecy of this baptism the promise had been given back in the old testament in joel chapter 2 reading from verse 28 and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. After the flesh, after they are saved, for all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. After they are sanctified, because it cleanses and it purges that flesh that individual is not talking about the flesh like flesh and bone like flesh and blood it's talking about the individual it's referring to the human being and he's talking about that human being as the flesh as the person and he says i'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons that the flesh the sons and your daughters that the flesh you refer to your daughters the flesh shall prophesy your old men that's the flesh you refer to your old men shall dream dreams and your young men the flesh shall see visions verse 29 and also upon the servants the flesh and upon the handmaids, the flesh, in those days, in the days to come, I will pour out my spirit. And then he tells us about the fulfillment in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, reading there from verse 16. But this is that. The Holy Ghost had come upon them. The fire had appeared. The wind had filled the whole house, and the Spirit had come upon them, and given them utterance. And they had spoken in another language, a new language that God had given them. He did not give the 120 the same language. He didn't give Peter that language, and then he spoke it over the microphone, if there was any microphone, and all the other 119 picked it up, saying the same thing. No. Because the people said, how do we hear them speak in our language, in which we were born? The Persians, the, all the other people. So it's not just, you know, one language that you know, somebody speaks and everybody copies. And when the Holy Ghost came upon them, it says this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, verse 17. 
it says, and shall come to pass in the last days. Now, that's interpretation of what Joel had said. Joel said, afterward. And now the interpretation came, that word, afterward, in um, Joel, is now explained to us in the last days. Says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. It's not just that they'll keep on speaking in tongues, they will prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, not just speaking in tongues, they will see far into the future what the Lord had ordained for them, sons and daughters, men and women, young men, young women to do. And your old men shall dream dreams. It's not thinking, talking about dreams in the night. The dream of going with the gospel. That's why we know that God doesn't expect anyone, any minister, any servant in his kingdom, in his household to retire. Why? Because they have the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost comes on them, those old men and doesn't say how old they become. They become 60, they become 70, 80, 90, 100. It says they, when they have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost remains and abides in them. And they don't retire. Your old men shall dream dreams. Verse 18. In verse 18, and on my servants, and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. It continues to tell us about this spirit that he had promised, a prophecy and the promise of the baptism. Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah Chapter 44, verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. We have to be thirsty. If we're thirsty, if we're desirous, a mind, a heart, a desires will be on receiving the power, the baptism, the immersion in the Holy Ghost. And I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. When the promise is fulfilled, when the prophecy is fulfilled, then the soil dry like the wilderness, like a desert, will pour the Holy Spirit upon us like you pour water on the dry ground. And I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offspring. In Isaiah chapter 55, when he gives the word, when he proclaims the word, when he prophesies about anything, and he says, this is what I will do, he fulfills it because he tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, Verse 10, for as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, verse 11, so shall my word be. Any word that comes out of him, so shall my word be. Any prophecy, any proclamation that comes from him, so shall my word be. That goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return 
unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. That's what gives us assurance. He has promised he will fulfill. That's what gives us assurance that the prophecy will be fulfilled. And we're told that God in his faithfulness he has promised and eventually he fulfilled. Look at Luke chapter 24. Look at what he promised. The promise of the Father. We're looking at Luke chapter 24 verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. In their own case, they were in Jerusalem. And that's where the power was to begin being manifested through their lives. And they were to tarry, tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Until. And that's a message for everyone. Every promise we get from the Father, every promise and every prophecy that is declared in the word, we tarry, we wait until we have the fulfillment of that promise. That means every message we hear, when we hear the message of salvation, we don't just say, okay, five minutes, God. And then we, as we are talking, and if our prayer reaches the middle of a sentence in five minutes, God, I'm sorry, my time is gone. I'll come back the other time. As we continue to do that, we're not going to receive the fulfillment of any promise in the Bible. And a promise of sanctification, holiness of heart, following peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We time our prayer. We look at the program. And if the time is going beyond that time, God, I'm sorry, I respect the program more than I respect God. I cannot wait. We're going to go to another thing. And so we have unfinished agenda, unfinished project, unfinished, unfulfilled promises and prophecies. You tarry until you be endued with power from on high. That's the promise he has given. Now, when he talks of power, it's not the power to shake. It's not the power to shout. It's not the power to run here and there. It's giving us the effect of the promise and the prophecy of the Holy Ghost. Look at John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Another comforter. That means that when we have the Holy Ghost, we have the resident comforter living inside us. Challenges will come. Problems will come. Pressures will come. And you'll not be so worried and so anxious and run away from that district to that other district. Why? So much problem, so much pressure in that place. When we have the baptism in the Holy Ghost, the Comforter resides in us that he may abide with you forever. He keeps on talking to us. He keeps on counseling us. And if you receive the Holy Ghost and the Comforter Counselor abides in you, when you go to college, you're not backslide. He abides with you forever. If you got the Holy Ghost before you were married, after the marriage, 
you don't uh, say, I didn't know this how marriage will be. You have the resident comforter abiding with you forever. And whatever situation you find yourself, and whatever challenges you have in life, he'll be talking to you, and he'll be showing you the reason why this is happening. That's the essence of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. But I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm tired. I'm weary. I don't know the next thing I'm going to do. I'm fed up. Ah, when you receive the Holy Ghost, another comforter, comforter like Christ, he abides with you forever. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. The Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth. The society, the world, is a world of liars. A world of deceivers. A world of untruthful people. And the world cannot receive the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of truth, because it sees him not. And they go by the fallacy of seeing is believing. And because they cannot see the Holy Ghost, they cannot receive. And of course, they don't want the truth. So, the spirit of truth is not going to force himself to live inside them. And it says, because they know, they know him not, neither knoweth him, but she know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. That's the difference between all the other experiences and Holy Ghost baptism. You're saved, the Spirit bears witness in your heart. You're sanctified, the Holy Spirit is with you, with you. You are baptized in the Holy Ghost, he shall be in you. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, for the comforter, the comforter, always remember that. You see? Because of the influence of other churches, we have relegated the ministry of the Holy Ghost baptism to speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues, and all the other benefits of the Holy Ghost baptism were forgotten. It says, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. You see, when the Holy Ghost comes, and you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, he resides in you. If anybody says something wrong, something erroneous, something false, the Holy Spirit will alert you. Not just speaking in tongues, you're alerted because he, the Holy Ghost, will teach you all things, all things, all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That is the evidence. The Holy Ghost is residing on the inside. And you don't forget what you heard yesterday. You see, there are people that their lives are like, you know, the back of the bowl. You pour water and the water cannot remain. They received it at the back of the bowl, not the inside of the bowl. And so everything they hear, they rejoice, they are excited, and then after that, they are forgotten. But when the Holy Ghost comes, he leads you into all truth. Not only that, he brings to your remembrance all things whatsoever I have commanded you, John chapter 15, verse 26. In John chapter 15, verse 26, but when the comforter is come, it comes to comfort. When the comforter is come, he arrives so that he will counsel you and comfort you and explain to you the 
dark things and the naughty things in your life that you couldn't understand by yourself so that all your confusion, all your conflict, every challenge you have, every, everything is taken away, it says, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth. Now, you do yourself a lot of disfavor. You do yourself a lot of harm. You don't do another person so much harm by if you delight in lying. The Holy Spirit will know you are committed to lying. You don't even have the mind to ask for the help of God to change. And you don't bother that the life of deception contradicts the life of salvation. And you are like that. The Holy Ghost will not come and reside in somebody whose action, whose attitude, whose apprehension, everything is of lying. But I will send unto you from the Father even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, and he shall testify of me. He shall testify of me. Verse 27. And ye also shall be a witness because the chief witness lives on the inside of you. The power to witness. The passion to witness. And the purpose of witnessing will reside in you. And ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. John chapter 16. And I'm reading here from verse 12. In John chapter 16, reading from verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you. Yet many things to say unto you. When you are not baptized in the Holy Ghost, when you are not filled with the Holy Ghost, many, many things, many things, many things that Christ still had to reveal unto you, you will not be able to know that. You might be prayerful, you might be zealous, you might be up and down, and you might be committed in quotes, you might be consecrated in quotes, but you do not have the baptism, the immersion in the Holy Ghost, the many things that he would have revealed to you by the arrival of the Holy Spirit, you will not have. I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. When you are not filled with the Holy Ghost, there are levels and heights of truth that you cannot bear. You might have been in the church for a long time. There are heights and there are depths of truth that you cannot bear. And, if, and immediately that is coming, you know it's not meant for you because you are not filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost and you miss quite a lot. In verse 13, in verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth because now you want to hear. Uh, people don't want to hear about the truth of restitution. They are not ready for that. They don't want that. All they want is this, this, and that. But you know, when the Holy Ghost comes, he leads the preacher into all truth. He leads the church into all truth. He leads the membership into all truth. He says he will guide you into all truth. And he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, 
that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Holy Ghost comes, and then he does that, he reveals that in our lives. We come to point number two. Point number two, the possession of power through the baptism. The possession of power through the baptism. When we're baptized, here is what God Christ himself has promised that he will immerse us. He will baptize us with power. He will make the power to reside in us. Look at that again, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but ye shall receive power. I thought they had power already. Yes, they had power. To them that believe on him, he gave the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. But, you know, we believers will carry on without remembering I have the power of sonship already. When temptation comes, I have the power of sonship already. When trials come, I have the power of sonship already. When persecution and trouble, when they come, I have the power of sonship already. And when the Holy Ghost comes, he reactivates the power we have already, the power of sonship. We have the power in sanctification, the power in holiness. But many times we forget our tongue will say something that confesses weakness, impossibility, and a life that is not holy, pure, circumcised, sanctified. But now we receive the Holy Ghost and all the power we had earlier. All that power is reactivated. And I know I'm a son, and I know I am a daughter, and I know that whatever comes my way, I have the power of sonship, I overcome. I am sanctified, and the power to live a holy life without fear. Before God, all the days of our life, to live in righteousness, in holiness, I have that power already, and it's activated in me. When the Holy Ghost comes, all the power that had been lying dormant, that you had before, everything is reactivated. And now the Holy Ghost comes. It comes in full force. And ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. It's not just, I believe, the doctrine. There's difference between doctrine, believing in doctrine, and having an experience. It says the experience we'll have is that we receive the power of the Holy Ghost. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria. And then it says, unto the uttermost part of the earth that the power he grants us. We'll see to need for the apostles' notes for all believers. Look at Acts chapter 3, chapter 6, verse 3. Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye among yourselves, among and out among you, seven men of honest report. Honest report. Dishonesty will hinder you from having the fulfillment of the prophecy and the promise of God. Dishonesty, unfaithfulness, 
in little things, in small things, in bigger things, dishonesty, unfaithfulness for the people nearest to you and the people far away from you. But honest men and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, and seeing the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. When we have, when we receive, when we're immersed in the Holy Spirit, it also brings faith along because faith is actually one of the gifts of the Spirit. He upgrades our faith, increases our faith, makes our faith to grow, and it gives us even the fullness of faith. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, it says, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Why? Because when the Holy Ghost has come, there will be a witness and you also, the Holy Ghost coming upon you will make you an effective witness in Jerusalem. And because of that, the Holy Ghost coming upon them, the church increased greatly in Jerusalem. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power. We've been told before he was full of faith. He had the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is resident. And the Holy Ghost is abiding and dwelling permanently. Because of that, the faith. And the power remained. It was not dwindling. And it did great wonders and miracles among the people. He wasn't an apostle. And yet because he had the fullness, the baptism, the immersion in the Holy Ghost. Look at what happened when you tarry, when you wait, when you ask. For that power of the Holy Ghost, and He comes, and you will come. I said, You will come. You will also act, you will not say, I'm not an apostle. What was the difference between Peter and Stephen? Not much. Only title. He, an apostle, he, an ambassador, and they both did great wonders and miracles among the people. Acts chapter 4 verse 31. In Acts chapter 4 verse 31 and when they had prayed the place was shaking where they were gathered, where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they speak the word of God with boldness. They have been baptized in the Holy Ghost in chapter 2. And now they came together. They were threatening of the persecutors. And they came to pray. When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. And you have the resident, comforter, counselor living in you. When there's persecution, you'll not be going about complaining, going about, did you hear what they're doing to me? Do you hear what is happening? And you'll not be looking for sympathizers. You'll go and pray. And when you pray, everything around you will be shaking in Jesus' name. And then you will speak the word of God with boldness. It tells us in verse 33. Verse 33, and with great power, gave the apostles witness 
of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's the power. He shall receive power. And we need to check up if it's only speaking in tongues, a repetition of speaking in tongues that you did how many years ago now. That's not the evidence. The continuing evidence, the increasing evidence, and the undeniable evidence that you have is that you have the power and with great power you give witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. First Thessalonians chapter 1 reading from verse 5 for our gospel came not unto you in word only. Our preaching came not unto you in word only. Our witnessing came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. That's what the presence of the Holy Ghost and the fulfillment of the promise of the Holy Ghost. That's what it does in our lives. That our words are witchy. There are some people, they talk, talk, and talk until their words are as light as feathers. Not witchy, not penetrating, not having any effect. And people don't take them serious. He talks and talks. He may apply logic, may apply whatever, but people will tell you. Are you depending on that? Don't you know him? He always talks like that. His word does not have the affirmation of the Spirit of God. But when we have the Holy Ghost resident in us, he makes us to speak in such a way. There is the power of the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know. What manner of men were were among you for your sake. And I told you that the power we had before at salvation, at sanctification, is soul winning. If that power is dormant now, he reactivates the power. Look at Matthew chapter 10. From verse 1. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, here the Lord Jesus Christ gave power, authority unto his disciples. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power. He gazed on clean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Then you remember in Matthew chapter 17, they brought a demon possessed boy. They could not cast him out. Because, and yet they are giving them power to cast out evil spirits. That power was becoming dormant. And you know, in the life of even Peter, that when the people, and they said, you are among his disciples, the power to affirm the truth, the power had become dormant. Fear had taken the place of power. And he said, no, I'm not. When the Holy Ghost comes, he reactivates even the power you had before. Look at Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. And the 17 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Verse 18. And he said, Unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. 
Look at verse 19. In verse 19, behold, I give unto you power. And I said, look at the disciples. This power had become dormant in them. They were now afraid of the Pharisees, of the Sadducees, of the conditions around. And it says, when Jesus was arrested, all the disciples, including these people, they all left him. They forsook him. They each have the power to stand. But now, when you have the Holy Ghost baptism, all the power you had before, all the power he had promised before, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing shall by any means hurt me. Nothing shall by any means hurt me. The power becomes dormant. And so I cannot go there. They frown at me. I'm afraid of them. I cannot go there. They will hurt me. I cannot listen to him. He has some caustic, cutting, acidic words. I'm afraid. I'm afraid of this, afraid of this, afraid of that, because the power that he had given us before had become dormant. But now the Holy Ghost comes. We're baptized, we're immersed in the Holy Ghost, and he shall receive power. And now, all the power we got before, they are reactivated today in Jesus' name. Not only that, now he gives us more, more power. Any candidate for more power, he'll give unto you in Jesus' name. Look at Acts chapter 16, verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought a master's much gain by so saying. As you go on in life, whether you're a minister or not, and as you go on in ministry, you'll find people that have extra sensory power. They look on their faces, their action, their muscles, their energy. They might be ladies. And the way they are audacious, what they can do, if you don't have the Holy Ghost and you meet such people in life, you'll not be able to carry out the purpose of your life, the plan of your life, the project of your life. And he'll follow you. And he'll follow you. While you're speaking, they speak with a louder voice. These are the men. And you don't have the power. You have to keep quiet for them. You have to give them chance. They are known. You are not known. They'll subdue you and submerge you. But you pray. You tarry in the presence of the Lord. And you have the power. Look at verse 17. In verse 17, the same followed Paul and us. And Christ saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. You know, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, flatterers will suck you in. They fl flatter you, they put you up. And what they're saying is, is true. These are the men, servants of the Most High God. They're not of God, but they speak the truth about you. Flatter you, lift you up. And put you on a horse. 
and they say, I'll take you through the city. Like Haman took Mordecai through the city. And yet, you know the heart of Haman. What well, was doing that? But when you have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost gives us discernment, the spirit of discernment. You'll not just be following people and following flatterers sheepishly. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, and this she did many days, but Paul being grieved. Paul, why are you grieved? The lady is saying, you are a servant of the most high God. Paul, why are you grieved? Because the lady is testifying that you and Silas and the rest of you, you are the servants of the most high God. And you show the way of salvation. It was great because the spirit in him, the Holy Ghost, discerning, revealed to him that this is not of God. You know, you know, be smiling at everything because, you know, people are saying this and this. They appreciate all them. They appreciate how great I am. They appreciate my calling. Uh, uh, Paul, being grieved, turned, and said to the Spirit, I command thee, in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. To come out of her. Tell me the next line. Tell me the first two words. He, 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 the spirit, he, the spirit, masculine, the spirit, energetic, the spirit. You know, there are people that normally they should be the weaker vessel, they should be timid. They should be shy, and it should appear weak as a lady. But the one that dwelt inside her, you not here for the title of any apostle, of anyone, because the one inside her, the she, the one inside her was masculine, and it came out the same hour. It'll come out before you. You will drive them out. When you have the power of the Holy Ghost, Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, understand, Christ had been with them. And he had commanded them to tarry in Jerusalem. And then he went away to heaven. And the word of God says, They with one accord assembled in one place with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And they were praying. He told them to tarry until they were filled to overflowing baptized in the Holy Ghost. They were faithful and they remained there praying and praying and praying. When we're that faithful to the message we're hearing, when we're that faithful that we remain and we abide and we're not just going through the Bible, just having our heads entertained by the word of God but we take it to heart and we wait and the day of Pentecost was fully calm they were all with one accord one purpose one pursuit 
one passion, one direction, one decision, one devotion, one dedication. One, they were all united together and they were with one accord in one place. Verse 2. In verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty rushing wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. You cannot copy that. This is not, you know, uh, they went so and so was baptized in the Holy Ghost. He shook, so I shake. He shouted, so I shout. He spoke, uh, you know, those syllables, and I listened very well, and I copied that. Why are we deceiving ourselves? It's like somebody saying, uh, when you have salvation, you have the joy of salvation. And then I see that that fellow is saved. I see the way he laughs, and I laugh that way. That's not salvation. You're just copying the joy. You don't have the salvation that brought the joy. I see that person sanctified, and I see the way he walks. He's holy, he's humble. He puts his hands at the back. He bends his head. Lowers a sedge. And I see that as the sign of his sanctification. And so God sanctify me, and you don't wait until he sanctifies you. I put my hands on the back, I bend my head, but you deceiving yourself. I see that that fellow is baptized in the Holy Ghost, and he speaks these words, and I speak them to you. That's the self deception now. Why don't you have the real power and tarry until ye are filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost? It tells us in verse 3. In verse 3, it says, And they appeared unto them, clothing tongues like as of fire, and it sat on each of them. Verse 4. In verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, not as the preacher gave them utterance, but as the Spirit gave them utterance. And after that, it arose up. And he spoke to the people that were gathered who were asking, what is this? They were told in verse 37. Verse 37, it says, now, when they had heard this, they were preached in their heart. They were not offended. They didn't try to say, why did you talk the way you talk? The Holy Ghost in that apostle allowed him to say what he said to them and they were preached in their heart and they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do? Verse 38 Then Peter said unto them repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, removal, cleansing, forgiveness of sin. And ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 39, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call, verse 40, and with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. This is the same Peter that could not stand before a single lady, a maid that said, are you not one of them? The power of 
of Holy Ghost now has come. And it is not just the speaking in tongues, but the power in the soul, in the spirit, in the mind, is the courage to make him now stand before the people. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this evil, sinful, untoward generation. Verse 41, then, they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. In verse 42, it says, and they continued steadfastly, the people that were saved were not people that, you know, just raised up their hands. Then during the follow-up time, you go to them. I'm coming from, you attended the GCK, didn't you? And we got your name, and I want to help you we'll study the word together until you become very steadfast in the Lord. Ah, yes, I was there, but you know, I have my own religion. I have my own assembly. Yes, I know that what I had there, I never heard anything like that before. But I have my own religion. No, these people, the power of the Holy Ghost from the preacher penetrated into their lives. They repented, they turned, and it says these 3,000 people continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And I pray that same power will be upon every one of us in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, the prayer and the passion with the baptism. When you are saved, you pray. But then, you hear the pattern of Christ early in the morning. He rose up and he went to a solitary place and he prayed. You want to follow that example. You need the resident Holy Ghost in you to help you to have that same prayer pattern. You hear that when Jesus Christ was, he knew that was going to die, he had sorrow. In that sorrow, he went to pray at Gethsemane. You see yourself, when you have sorrow, you cannot pray. When you are sad, you cannot pray. If you are praying at all, you are not praying, O oh Lord, thy will be done. You are saying, God, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I'm crying. I'm suffering. I'm, I'm dying. But if you're going to pray like Jesus Christ prayed, how God anointed him of the Holy Ghost and power. That same Holy Ghost, that same power will be in your life. Whether you are sad or sorrowful, whether you are glad or happy, whether you are down or up, the prayer of your life will be so definite that in whatever situation you have, you find yourself, you pray. You have the Holy Ghost baptism by praying. You keep the Holy Ghost baptism by praying. The prayer and the passion. Luke chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 9. In Luke chapter 11, reading from verse 9, And I say unto you, ask, 
and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. That's the promise he has given us. Ask, that means pray. Seek, that means pray. Knock, that means pray. And he says, when you ask, it shall be given unto you. When you seek, you will find. When you knock, it says, it shall be opened unto you. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, if he then, being evil, evil by nature, before you are saved, before you are sanctified, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more? How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? Give the Holy Ghost unto them that ask him. Look at a child coming to the Father Ask him for maybe school fees or something for the child. Has too many things on his plate, on our plate. I need to do this. I need to do this. I need to do this. And one of the items is I need to see my father and settle all this school fees issue. And then he's, uh, you know, a well-planned child. I give 30 minutes to that, I give 15 minutes to that, I give 5 minutes to that, and I give 2 minutes for that. And now the time I give my father, I give him 2 minutes. Then he comes, she comes to the father. Daddy, good morning. I need his coffee. And she watches the time. And, uh, and then a 2 minutes gone. And that's the time she has apportioned to talk to the father. She has not even got into the edge of her request. Off she goes. Hey, my son, my daughter, you have, have not asked, have not known what you really came for. Yes, daddy, my time was up. I am a timekeeper. You miss a lot in your life. That you come to the Heavenly Father. And you are talking to the Heavenly Father. And he wants to give you the power of the Holy Ghost. And somebody conditions you that you must not exceed this time in talking to your Heavenly Father. And he so preconditioned you and preconditioned the whole church. The church of the powerless. It says, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? It's not the pastor that gives the Holy Spirit. It's not the preacher that gives the Holy Spirit. How much more shall your Father who is in heaven, your heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to them? them that ask him ask him ask him and if you are a true friend of the church when the church is asking for the power that will sustain us the power that will strengthen us you will not distract us you leave us to pray and to ask the Heavenly Father. Program, timing is not as important as having. He told us to tarry, to seek, to ask until we endured with power from on high. James chapter 1, we're looking at verse 5. In James chapter 1 verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, if any of you lack power, if any of you lack unction, 
if any of you lack passion, if any of you lack the baptism, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given unto him. Amen. Verse 6, it says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. As you ask, you ask in faith, the Lord will answer. Mark chapter 11. We're reading from verse 24. Therefore, I say unto you, what think soever salvation? What think soever sanctification? What think soever Holy Ghost baptism? What think soever ye desire power, power in the Holy Ghost? What think soever ye desire when ye pray? Believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Ye shall have them. What are you? Ye shall have them. But the point is, do you desire the power, the fullness, the baptism in the Holy Ghost? It comes with desire first. As you come.